Hello and welcome to Our Professor Podcast. I'm Micah Sander. I'm Carter Green. And in this episode of our podcast, we talked with Professor Lauren Mancia. Professor Lauren Mancia is a historian of medieval Christian devotional practices. She received her BA from Columbia University, her MA from University of Toronto, and her PhD from Yale. She's the author of Emotional Monasticism, Effective Piety in the 11th Century Monastery of John of Fécamp, and Meditation and Prayer in the 11th and 12th Century Monastery, Struggling Toward God. She is also a lecturer at the Met Cloisters, and next year she'll be a visiting scholar in the Performance Studies Department at NYU. To talk about Professor Mancia, we have a student who knows her very well and has taken her classes and enjoys them. We have with us Shay. Welcome, Shay, to our Professor Podcast. Welcome. Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing all right. Good. good. Shay! <laughs> <laughs> Shay! What is it like taking a class with Professor Mancia? It's fun. She is one of the mo- more expressive teachers where like, you can tell she really loves the topic that she teaches. It's a lot of reading. <laughs> you can also agree with that, Micah. It's a lot of reading, but uh, For sure. in the end, it's always, it's like, it's worth it to read the stuff that she's she's giving you. Now, Shay. <clears throat> <sighs> It's Shay, right? Am I saying yeah, it right? It, it, Shay? It is, okay. Yeah. Shia. Spell it. Shia. Uh, um, <laughs> what what sets Professor Mancy apart from the other professors? What makes her class? I mean, they they fill up all the time, so they, they must be popular. I think she's very experimental, right? Where she's like, she likes to try new things. Doesn't matter how quirky it might seem. In our class this week. She had guest speakers come in and basically like performance artists. And we, as a class, got to do different movements, different activities, I guess, that puts us into a space. And like, I've never had a class like that before. So it's, it's, she likes to bring in new things that just may not be what everyone else does, but it's always fun. Well, I think that's a good place to start. Then we should get right to the interview because this is. To be honest, this is one of my favorite interviews that we did. Please, everybody, give a humongous, I haven't said humongous yet, humongous, our professor podcast welcome to Professor Lauren Mancia. Yay! Woo! Woo! (laughs) Professor Mancia, thank you so much for doing this interview with us we'd like to just dive right in and ask you uh why did you get into history why this area of study particularly and was there anyone inspiring in your academic career cool thank you guys so much for having me i'm so excited to be talking to you and to be talking to the students out there um, who might be history majors so I think I have I have two answers to this question. I have, you know, very personal answers and then I have more global answers. You know, I think I'll I'll start with the personal answers and then I'll shift over. The the reason why I am a history professor is because I'm interested in the Middle Ages. So as a student, I was an English major and I thought that I would get at the Middle Ages through English. And then I realized that literature wasn't quite the thing. And so I then got a master's degree in medieval studies as in a way to sort of explore disciplines, basically. And then I got a PhD in history. So history wasn't immediately the department that I was drawn to because I thought it was going to be too fact heavy. Um, and I was interested in exploring sort of the spirit of the time. I was interested in exploring culture. I was interested in exploring art. And so I thought, they don't do that in history. I'm not going to go over there. And the undergraduate history classes that I took seemed to confirm that. They were very political history, very economic history, very traditional. And so I was like, I'm in the right place. Turns out that I was wrong, right? And that I just happened to sort of draw two classes that were more traditional. And so through my exploration of an interdisciplinary program of medieval studies, I was like, actually, the questions I'm asking are history questions to ask. So that's one reason why I ended up in history. But the other reason, and this is why sort of this is how it applies to lots of people, is that in history, I can do anything, 
in a literature department, I really have to look at literature. And I think in the Middle Ages, we can qualify lots of things as literature, right? Sermons can be literature, pamphlets can be literature. But at the end of the day, you're really interested in textual productions in a literature department. In a history department, I can be interested in how people felt historically. I can be interested in what people thought was beautiful historically. I can be interested in where people lived historically. All of those are, are history questions. And then the, the question about was there a particular important sort of mentor, I think that you know, I came to study the Middle Ages based on having been in a church. I went I went in ninth grade with my family to Europe for the first time. And in my memory, I was in a church in Florence that was medieval. I don't remember which church it was. I don't remember if it was actually medieval, but the light was streaming through the stained glass windows. And there was in my ninth grade mind, medieval chant being sung, even though again, who knows if that's actually true. And I was really interested in the sort of like complete experience that was being created. And that experience to me felt incredibly theatrical. And as a young student, I was doing a lot of theater. And in college, I was choosing between being a professor or doing theater. And so the Middle Ages to me felt like a time period, especially churches, right, the, the religious context of the Middle Ages, felt like um, contexts that were incredibly performative and using the same kinds of embodied engagement plus text, plus intellect, plus sound, plus vision, plus senses that I was interested in in creating theatrical experiences. So the my attraction to the period is my attraction to like the whole experience of human life. Um, and I feel like I can really do that well in the Middle Ages. Um, so initially, I was drawn to it from going to this place, going to the Middle Ages in Italy, right, as best I can. And then I sort of explored it, um, not with the help of a lot of professors, actually. I think that, like, my attraction to the period had little to do with mentorship that was being modeled to me and more to do with my own personal exploration. So I like went to the cloisters and I was like, I like how this place feels. This place feels awesome. I'm interested in the feeling I have in this place. And so then I would take a class in, you know, monastic uh, music, right? Um, but it wasn't the inspiration of faculty or something that drew me, drew me here. When I think about mentorship, like the mentorship I've received through my university training, I think about first and foremost that the way that I received mentorship was not the way that you see in the movies, right? That my, the stereotype about like one teacher who's like Dumbledore or something and has all the wisdom and like is your one-stop shop for all the things, right? Never happened to me. And I was always very sad that it didn't happen because I thought I was missing out. But I think that surprised by how much mentorship I got from my peers, right, that what I needed was commiseration. I needed people who were two years older than me to tell me that it was okay, to tell me, oh, you should take this class with this person or to tell me, don't do that. It's going to be a mistake, you know, and then also that I like you know, I got little slices of mentorship from different people in different ways, right? So I dedicated my very first book to all of my female professors because I really felt like what I needed and what I, I think continue to need is women who have a, a experience that's very much reflected by their gender or inflected by their gender, um, telling me how to navigate the world in, in a way that, that's similar to my experience, right? Like, how do you do this as a mother? How do you do this as a woman? How do you do this as a wife, right? Or as someone has certain particular ambitions to be a person who has a family? Like, I needed that kind of mentorship more than I needed, like, you know, the Middle Ages mentorship. Although I got some of that too, obviously, you know. We spoke with uh, Professor Johnson and we mentioned the good-natured rivalry between the modernists and the pre-modernists in the history department. And of course, you know, there's no actual attempt to put down or disrespect the other's field. But do you find yourself having to 
constantly prove the value of pre-modern history to students, to the college, to the world, that it just doesn't get the, the love or appreciation that it really deserves? Well, I have to say that all of us, first of all, um, all the professors have uh, secondary and tertiary fields that they took lots of classes in. So like just the other day, a musicologist at Brooklyn who studies American um, musicology was like, oh, medieval, the one that got away. I desperately wanted to be a medievalist, right? And Professor Johnson also took a, ter a tertiary field in medieval. So, you know, the rivalry is is a lot of show, I think. You know, that said, the New York State Regents just tests on post-1492, right? And, and some of that is that you know, you can't test students on more than 500 years. Like it's it's actually a lot, right? And so some of it is just logistical. But I do think that the academic job market is increasingly sort of turning towards the modern, again, because there's just so much more history. There's, you know, as the academy decolonizes, we need more and more fields that we never had before. And so what do they want to eliminate? They want to eliminate the stuff that's really old, right? Very few people teach ancient Egyptian history. Very few people learn Hittite, right? Like these fields are dying in part because there's just not enough people. And also because they're hard, right? They require you to learn lots of languages. They require you to understand cultures that have very fragmentary resources. You know, like a fragmentary source record is harder to study um, in some respects than one that has a newspaper database or whatever. But I think also that, and this is where I get on the soapbox, right? I think that our contemporary moment is very focused on our contemporary moment, right? And our historical memory is not very long, right, as Americans. And you all know this just as students of 20th century history, right? Like, we forget stuff that happened 10 years ago. So how do we expect to remember what happened a 1,000 years ago, right? But what's important, I think, is that the perspective on humanity, on the sort of history of humans, right, needs to be long. I think ever more importantly needs to be pre our modern conception of race, pre our modern conception of capital and capitalism and labor, right? Pre our modern conception of the individual over the community. Those phenomena, in my opinion, are really urgent for us to understand right now. And if we just understand them for from the perspective of the last 100 years or 300 years, we're not going to get to how humans lived before an understanding of the individual that is modern, before an understanding of capitalism. And that perspective is essential, right? We can't dismantle these phenomena that are hurting our society without understanding what the alternatives are. And the pre-modern period has a lot of alternatives, right? So I think it's ever more urgent for us to study pre-modernity, even though at the same time, I get that like we don't have enough room <laughs> to hire all the people that we need to hire and to train all the people we need to train. And the other thing I will just say, right, is that for a very long time, we had a conception of Western civilization with quotes, right? And we had a conception that the pre-modern world that was worth studying, all of this has quotation marks in it, right? Like that was the sort of like inheritance of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, right? And I think that one of the things that all fields are doing is moving away from this understanding of Western civilization, moving away from an understanding of the sort of like great books of Western literature, the great art of Western society. And I think the pre-modern is doing that also, right? So if we're interested in examining things like indigenous culture, right? Not only do we need people who do sort of like North American indigenous societies, right? We also need people who work on pre-modern contact between sort of Asia, Africa, and Europe, and how the idea of Western European didn't actually exist in Greece and Rome in the way that historians say it did, right? So much of pre-modern culture has been inflected by this Western superiority, Western civilization narrative, but the solution is not to say like, well, we shouldn't study that anymore. The solution is to say, actually, what was it really <laughs> if we don't like color it with our modern eyes, you know? 
And because again, like there's more solutions in there, there's more um, wonder in there, there's more stuff we haven't, we've forgotten as a human civilization. I'll get off the soapbox, but I'll get back on any second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I don't know about my modernist co-host, but I think that. Uh, I agree. I agree. I agree. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But Professor Massey, you study the history of religion, mainly medieval Christianity, as you said, through ritual practice and emotion. But you don't just you don't look at just the books. You you really engage with your students. You have them meditate. You have them sing monastic chants. You have them act out scenes in front of the class, and you really emphasize learning through experiences. How did you develop these, and how does that? help your students understand everything about your subject? Well, so first of all, like a lot of this pedagogical stuff that I'm doing is really relatively new. So, you know, as historians, we are really biased to favor the archive, right? To favor the textual archive. We want proof in writing that something happened, right? And I think over the course of the 20th century, we've started to question whether or not things that have happened according to texts actually happened, right? We've identified how the archive creates silences, right? And some of the silences that it creates are experiential, right? Like how do we understand what happened between the texts, right? How do we understand how the texts were received? as people? Were they prescriptions, these texts? Were they re records of what happened, right? Like these, these questions have existed for a long time. When we're dealing with something like religion, the question then gets even, I think, more urgent, right? Uh, we're dealing then not with dogma or doctrine or theology or even ritual practices that are being prescribed. We're dealing with like, why people did what they did, right? Why did they believe what they believed? And in order to answer that question, we need to transcend the textual archive to understand what the answers could be. We also know as historians that we shouldn't just be like LARPing all the time, right? Like that there's to some extent we can understand how a, how a civil war battle worked if we like wear authentic uniforms and like get in formation or whatever, but we also don't understand it, right? So it's a new thing that I'm doing to try to figure out what is between creative anachronism and just spending time with text, right? Now, I'm interested in figuring this out for sort of the scholarly audience. And so that's my new project and we can talk about that. But the nice thing about teaching is that it's an arena in which we can play and that we don't have the sort of scholarly disciplinarians sort of yelling us every time we want to experiment a little bit with what it would be like to feel like these people, right? Like how is it that we can, can learn from experiencing something with our bodies um, in a way that is just as useful, I think, as learning to read a text or learning to experience a text in whatever way we want to in an archive. So that is part of what it is that I'm then integrating into my classes. And the reason why I think it's important for students is one, like it's really uh, hard to be in college and just be using one part of your brain, right? You're just consuming text. You're just speaking in class. Like it's just, you know, read and then speak and then read and then speak and then write and then read and then speak. We've known for a long time as teachers that people learn in different ways, right? We know that really well in elementary education, like that there's some learners who run around and that there's some learners who learn by climbing and learn by singing and whatever. And we like beat it out of students over the course of high school and certainly into college. And we're like, you're just sitting thinking beings who read texts, right? And so how is it that we can engage with something that is really very emotional, the history of religion, right? The history of desire, of longing, of struggle, right? That's what religion is, right? How do we engage with it? Well, we shouldn't just engage with it as like text robots. We should also engage with it as embodied creatures who are the, who are parallel then to the creatures that we study, right? Monks process in church, right? Monks think that they can't just pray while sitting, that they have to pray while lying face down on the floor and while looking up at the sky and while moving their bodies around, right? 
by engaging some of the embodied practices that historical people used, what do we awaken about the text? But also, and this is what's most important about learning in college, I think, what do we awaken in ourselves, right? Like, yeah, I want my students to understand what happened in the Middle Ages, but mostly I want them to understand what happened in the Middle Ages and how it can be useful to them in their lives, right? Y'all are not going to be medievalists, right? Like maybe one of you is, right? But like y'all are going to learn about, you know, what it is that you want and how it is to live an intentional life by examining medieval monks who tried to figure out what they wanted and tried to live intentional lives, right? It is that analogy that I want you to take away. And so how do we make that analogy even more powerful for you by transcending the text? You know, that's my my new uh, philosophy um, and why it is that I'm making my poor students sing and kneel and practice the liturgy. It's not, it's not hyper-Christian. It's all like de-Christianified, um, but like create an intentional lifestyle. Like that is, I think, important to learn. I've only heard good reviews about <laughs> your your monasticism class and all the activities you have people do. So I wouldn't worry about that. So good. Good. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> but continuing on this point, a large part of the work you do involves helping students remove their their modern blinders when studying the Middle Ages. So for instance, trying to look back at this period with modern conceptions of gender and sexuality, it it doesn't really allow one to fully appreciate these concepts in the medieval world. It's a kind of mental heavy lifting and perspective that doesn't really apply when you're studying history from the last few decades or from the later 20th century. How do you go about untangling people's modern views and biases in studying the Middle Ages? And which areas do you find are hardest for students to grasp? This is a great question. And, and I would argue, you know, that the conceptions of gender 30 years ago or 10 years ago, really even, right, like are also constantly transforming, right, that I think that as I'm, I mean, this, I've never practiced modern history, but my guess is that we have to do this kind of thing also as modernists. And I can feel just teaching for the last 10 years, especially in my gender class, um, transformations that are already happening. You know, I read Judith Butler for the first time this semester and was like, good Lord, I should stop reading this text. It's super transphobic. Everything is a process. Nothing is stable. And so like, it's just the the work of a historian to, to constantly take these blinders off. And I will say that I just had dinner with a friend of mine who is a consultant, like she's in business, international business consultant. Don't ask me beyond that what she does. So, but it's a big deal, you know, and she was a religion major and she says constantly, like, I really think that religion is what taught me how to listen to the people that I'm consulting with, right? She goes into businesses, tries to figure out what the problem is, and then tries to fix it. And she was like, the only way I can really do that is by listening through empathy, through trying to get in their mindset, and then through sort of like using my outside consultant brain to fix it, right? And I think that that's what we're doing as historians of any period. That said, you know, we don't really even understand how much our brains are wired as modern people. And so I think that there are lots of uh, ways to get in the medieval mindset, right? Like one is through repetition. I think that I do this too, right? I have to constantly slough off my modern mindset too. Rereading things over and over again, bombarding them with different things next to them, different sources, different experiences, different ways of looking at the source, different contexts, right, from the Middle Ages or whatever, right? If I'm reading an ancient medical text and then thinking about how it was applied by a theologian in the 12th century and then how it was applied by a pope in the 13th century and then how it was applied by a, a secular leader in the 15th century, right? I'm actually seeing that ancient text both through the eyes of its interpreters and as it's as what it's saying in and of itself, right, in different ways. And so doing that kind of gymnastics constantly is going to help sort of shake up my understanding of, of that text and then shake my modern mindset. But I think embedding yourself in a context is very helpful. So I had never until this semester taught a class on monasticism before, right? I've always taught classes that are on 
you know, a thousand years of medieval history, all the contexts, all the people, one class on every context, one class on every person, right? Basically, when you just spend time like in basically the 12th century, in basically one context, you burrow down and then you really start to say, oh man, like the way they think of community versus individual is not in that kind of dualism, right? It's not community versus individual. And so you really start to then think like, how is the individual functioning in this community? Do they feel themselves as practicing obedience, as giving up individual rights or not? If they don't, like what is their self-conception? And then how does that transform how I think about myself as a citizen of the United States, right? And how I operate within the community of Brooklyn College or within the community of the history department, right? What are my needs in my own community of my family? And how do I insist as an individual that they be met in a way that is unmedieval, right? Like all of that is helpful in being like really zeroed in in one context. There are lots of different ways to remove these blinders. The process of removing the blinders is what is fun, I think, about studying the pre-modern because it's shocking and it's weird and it's funny um, and it's, you know, it troubles what we think is true, um, what we hold on to as truth. And so for all of those reasons, it's a great, it's fun. It's a fun process. Well, to talk about something more modern, <laughs> uh, you have a new book coming out. Uh, yeah. Meditations and Prayers in the 11th and 12th Century Monastery, Struggling Towards God. In it, you uh, you write, quote, this book hyper-focuses on the off-ignored emotional laboratory that was the medieval monastery in the 11th and 12th century, a multimedia landscape in which devotees regularly articulated the unexpected and often beautifully expressed limitless struggle towards God. You write that historians miss things when they have tried to always connect monasticism to bigger ideas or trends. And what makes this book unique and different is that you deeply investigate the emotional experiences of the individual monks and nuns. My question for you is, what is what is lost when the historian skips over the more personal history? And what is gained by studying monasticism, monastic experience specifically? And what are what are some of your favorite anecdotes and stories you found during researching this? You know, I think that it's hard as modern people living in mostly secular humanist society within the sort of public sphere, although this is this is not 100% true of all of the students at Brooklyn College, right? But but I think that, you know, the academy is secular, the academy is humanist, the world that we live in is a sort of post-enlightenment pro-science, right? Like pro-science versus religion, like thinking of it as opposed to religion, right? I think that it's very hard in this arena, right? This scholarly landscape, this scholarly climate to see Catholic medieval subjects as something that isn't cynical or cynically motivated, right? And so I think that what a lot of scholarship of the last 50 years have done to monks is that they've said, look, they're, you know, they're the Pope's henchmen, they're helping wage this crusade, which we now understand as a kind of proto-colonialist enterprise, right? They're, they're often connecting what they know happens after the Middle Ages to what is happening in the 12th century. And that is great and we need that. And it's it's sometimes incredibly effective, right? One of the one of my favorite medieval books or books written by a medieval historian is about the Albigensian Crusade, which is this 13th century crusade that Christians launch on other Christians living in Spain, right? Christians who are supposed to be heretics, right? And this is an amazing transformation of the Crusades, right? Initially, they're launching against people who are not Christian, Jews and Muslims, right? In order to, in some ways, help define their Christian identity. And then they start attacking within the Christian identity. And that's, I think, really fascinating. So right around 2001, this a historian, Mark Pegg, wrote this book about how there were no Albigensians. The Albigensians were created by the church as like a sort of heretical sect that people needed to fight against. And he did this in comparison with George Bush, 
writing about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction, right? You know, that kind of thing is super helpful and quite beautiful, right? Um, to see medieval history put to that kind of use. That said, <laughs> I think that like, that is the majority of the narrative that we have about monks living in community before the 13th century. That once we have Franciscans living in the world or Dominicans living in the world, once we have individual female mystics running around, we have a religious phenomena that we then say, oh, that's real religion, right? It's religion that is like hell with hell with this opulence, right? Like we're gonna be poor, we're really committed, unlike those other guys, you know, or like these ladies having these ecstatic rapturous moments, right? That's real, but the institutional monasticism, that's not real, that's all just uh, the church the institution of the church's henchmen. There's constant sort of reference in the scholarship to like liturgical ritual, repetitive ritual, equaling automatons, right? People who are not thinking that are operating in community and that are just going through the motions without thinking about it. And that's what I wanted to bust open, right? We need to see how monastic communities, how religious communities are not just like a bunch of yes men blindly following orders, you know, that that's not what they're doing. And that like communal religious ritual actually can be felt, it can be filled with emotion, you know. Part of what I focused on in my book is to think about moments when that ritual fails, you know, moments when you have these monks who have dedicated their lives to God, who are like the prayer factories of the medieval landscape, right? You have these prayer factories of the medieval landscape. They're the ones who are best equipped to do this prayer, and they still feel like they're not doing a good job, right? And that's what I think is interesting, that insecurity, that struggle, that can tell us a lot as people, right? People who are not perfect, right? That that us laymen are also not perfect. And like, how do we deal with that? How do we keep going when we feel like everything is stacked against us? And that's what the monks are wrestling with also. And I think that's interesting that they could have lifetime commitments to being sort of celibate and cloistered and singing the Psalms eight times a day for their whole lives and still not give up, but still feel like they're failing. Like that's an interesting emotional matrix that I wanted to explore. So, you know, those are the reasons why I've written what I've done. And, and it's not necessarily a micro history about a personal experience, then it's like trying to reclaim the other half of what this institutional experience is. And that's the emotional half. And I'm doing it with textual sources. Maybe in my next project, I won't stay tuned. Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> but just like a quick, yeah. you know, story, right? Like, so for instance, there's a lot of great medieval sources from monasteries that are sort of written by monks for monks. And so there's a lot of great saints' lives, right? Glorifying great monks who lived at the monastery, right? And lots of people see this as like some kind of patriarchal boys club, which it totally was, like totally big celebration of all the great men of monastic, you know, lives or whatever, right? Great. That's what this is. It's a glorifying themselves history for sure. But some of the miracles in these lives are freaking awesome. So there's an order of monks that decides that they can't have servants doing their work anymore, that they have to have monks doing the work. They have to be shearing the sheep. They have to be working in the fields, not servants. And so to promote this new lifestyle, they have a whole collection of saints' lives about toiling monks. And my favorite one is that a monk is working in the fields and he's sweating and it's hot and it's hard. And the Virgin Mary appears to him and takes a cloth and wipes the sweat off his brow and wipes the sweat off his fellow monk's brow and then squeezes this washcloth of sweat into a chalice and then drinks it. And it's just like, it's awesome. It's so cool, right? <laughs> so, you know, whether that happened or not, right? Like the phenomenon of like needing to be so invested in the work that you're doing through this, through the help of this vision, right? The, the intensity of the commitment then of these monks to this kind of system of belief is fascinating to me. And that they do it with all kinds of wacky stuff like that is just, is just makes it all really rewarding. So Lots of good stuff like that. The best stories are in the Middle Ages. I will fight anyone on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> the, so there's the book coming out, but then is are there any other major projects or current research or new classes coming up that you're that you're excited about? 
an exhibit per se? Yeah, I'm yes, so exactly. glad you asked. It's a, real, it's a real softball question. Yeah. It is. It is. So the book is coming out, and then we have this fantastic exhibit that's opening on May 2nd in the Brooklyn College Library archives, which is on the first floor in the special exhibition space, and a bunch of history students, including the two interviewers here, right, have helped me and Professor Lucas Rubin, who's the director of the Latin Greek Institute, put together this exhibit that initially we thought was just going to be celebrating female pre-modernists who taught at Brooklyn College from 1930 to 1980. And the reason why we had this idea was one, it's the 50th anniversary of the Latin Greek Institute. This is one of the most renowned classical language institutes in the whole world. And it's housed at Brooklyn College at CUNY. It's a big feather in our cap. We don't celebrate it enough, right? And then the second reason is that I kept hearing all these stories about these absolutely amazing women who used to teach pre-modern stuff at Brooklyn College and Brooklyn College never celebrates them, right? They have, you know, amazing stories of, you know, great moments in sexism, right? Like where one of them decodes linear B and then she dies tragically early and then some man gets credit for it. Like, you know, stuff like that. You just, it's great. We need to talk about it. The woman who has single-handedly overturned the notion of feudalism actually taught in the history department at Brooklyn College in 1974, wrote this groundbreaking article that every medievalist reads like we need to celebrate that too right but then we got in the archives and we found all kinds of amazing stuff that one tells tales of the the sort of uh discrimination that women experienced at the academy before 1980 which was were sort of amazing artifacts of that that we did not anticipate B, we learned a lot about the history of the humanities at Brooklyn College so we learned that at times of adversity after World War II after the budget um, uh, fiscal crisis in New York City, after open enrollment at CUNY, sort of plummets the the open admissions at CUNY, plummets the enrollments of CUNY, right? All of these moments in history made CUNY double down on the humanities, right? And that we are in a similar moment right now um, in 2023, right? That we have this solution in the archives that we could double down on the humanities, right? Suddenly this exhibit has gotten sort of a new a new uh, purpose basically within Brooklyn College that it can celebrate what we've been and that can it can also use history to advise what we can be still, right, as an institution. So that's going to be open from May until December 2023 bring all your friends. It's open to non-CUNY people too. It's awesome. And it's a testament to what Brooklyn College history students and classic students can do together. They all were in the archives. There's this huge archive at Brooklyn College that has the potential to tell all kinds of stories through the stuff that Brooklyn College has left behind. So that's awesome. Second thing that we're doing is that I'm working with a classics professor, Brian Sowers, to um, have a, a big exhibition, and I'm sorry, big uh, conference um, in June um, on uh, experience, religious experience, the question of how we can figure out the question of religious experience for late antiquity to the central Middle Ages. And a couple of professors from Brooklyn, so Professor Stern and Professor Sowers and Professor Ball are going to be speaking in that interdisciplinary conference. And then next year I'm on leave all year and I'm going to spend the year as a visiting scholar in the NYU Performance Studies Department. So, you know, if you think it's bad now with the singing and the lying on the floor, it's just going to get worse. And so when I come when I come back and follow 2024, I'm sure there'll be some new classes that will be brewing next year that I will inflict on all you people <laughs> oh but but I, I love that for you going getting to teach that there oh that's you're gonna really enjoy that that sounds like it so sounds much like a ball yeah, yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's not that I get to teach it's that I get to learn so as a visiting scholar I get to be a student and just take oh. a lot of classes and all oh, I have to do is give one lecture and then otherwise I get to teach take classes it's the best it's the oh, so even fun. better even better yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh we're nearing the end of our interview here we just have one final segment that is usually you know it's the it's the toughest one it's the one where the professors sweat the most uh just a <laughs> quick five questions uh just try and first answer that comes to your mind uh, i'm going to throw a few at you 
What's your favorite book? So I love Rebecca Goldstein. She's a, a philosophy professor and an expert in Spinoza, but she also writes fiction. So I love her books because they take sort of heady philosophical concepts and apply them to sort of realistic fiction women's lives. So The Mind-Body Problem, one of my favorite books, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God. These are all Rebecca Goldstein books. Have a little feminist bent. This is my cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> favorite food? I love anything with regatta in it. So cannoli, lasagna, ravioli, you know, I'll drink, I'll drink it. I'll eat it straight, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> put regatta on it and I'll eat it. <laughs> favorite non-work activity? Oh, so I think I, I love, um, I have a seven-year-old daughter. And so I love fall, spring, summer biking with her around the city. We have a cargo bike. So she sits on the back and she like holds my waist and it's just like nice. You know, she comments on stuff, points at weird houses. It's great. And then I love taking that bike ride with her to a friend's house and having her and the friends play in a different room while I talk to their parents. That's my, those are my favorite New York activities. <laughs> <laughs> So if that, that's also your favorite thing to do in New York City, then I'll just go to. Um... Oh, well, no, I can give you I can give you the more erudite answer for New York Ooh, City. Oh, OK. Like, OK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, this is my my uh, date night advice to people. Right. So my favorite New York City evening grown up activity is to go to Cafe Sabarsky in the Noya Gallery and have like a full like soup course, like schnitzel course, and then soccer tort course, like the whole thing, and then go to the Met at night. Those are, you know, it's like, one of the, it's a great date. Um, no one's ever taken me up on it or told me, I mean, like no one has taken me on that date, but that's fine. Like what I'm saying is like, I keep telling my brother that this is the, this is the key to getting, a, getting a lady and he just doesn't follow my directions, but y'all should do that. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Write it down. Write it down. Yes. Um, nighttime museums in New York is the best. Yeah. <laughs> Final one, favorite music genre. So this is, I think I'm very disappointing here. You know, I think like I have fought very hard to be cool in my musical tastes, but I have to say that like, I really like Elizabethan consort music and Baroque music. It's the only thing I actually actively listen to. So I have like certain albums that my husband has like listened to with me and stuff, but I'm not gonna take his cool and put it on myself. It's nerd, you know? <laughs> Sounds like you're winning at being cool, if you ask me. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right on. This is my Pretty people. cool. <laughs> you're talking to the right crowd. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> oh, uh, Professor Mancia, this conversation made me so happy. I really had such a fun oh, time. Uh, it's been good. a pleasure. Oh, yeah. my pleasure. My pleasure. It's super Thank fun. You. I'm happy. You know, like I. You know, I, I feel like I want to also just say that, you know, these are, this is like preaching to the choir a little bit, right? Like this is like nerding out about history with historians. Um, but I'll leave you with like one final anecdote, which is, you know, I'm going to throw my, my baby brother under the bus again. So my brother is also a business consultant. He went to engineering school. He got a bachelor's in engineering. Um, and then he was a trader for a while and, you know, uh, was a tech consultant and then a management consultant. And now he's an innovation consultant. And in his engineering degree, he only had to take two liberal arts courses. And he took a class on the history of Sicily, which is where my, our family is from, which, you know, I respect. And then he taught, he took like a philosophy class. And a year ago, he was like, I need to up my humanities education. Y'all are saying things and I don't know what you're talking about, right? And so I sent him to the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, which has great classes, four week long classes for, you know, adults in New York City um, who are not academics, but who are taught, being taught by experts in their field. And he took a Marx 101 class and it has literally blown his mind. His mind has been blown because I mean, all of us we read Marx and we're like, "Good God, Marx, that you is so smart!" You know, he's so smart. But like, as a result, my brother is like, he's completely revising his life plan. He's trying to think about how he can market to business people that the humanities are important. Like, you know, everything is. 
his perspective has completely changed. His mind has been completely open. So, you know, if anyone is listening still at like minute 45 to this podcast, <laughs> I just want to say like, you did the right thing by majoring in history or majoring in the humanities. Like you're never, ever going to regret being able to open your mind, like being, having opened your mind for, for the years that you were an undergrad and then being, having the facility to do it again after uh, college is over. So right on. Even if you're not a history a history major, it's cool. Just open your mind. Minor, <laughs> minor. Yes. At least, yeah, yeah. <laughs> our professor podcast was recorded with the permission of the Brooklyn College History Department and our student interviewees. We would like to thank both the students and the faculty for their contributions. 